Well, hello everybody. I'm going to get started now. Um, apologies again for having to reschedule. Uh, that was an issue that was outside of my control, and but I do apologize for it. I know that that has made it a little difficult uh, for people to be able to attend. So I'm glad you could make it. Um, hopefully you can see me and hear me. Um, if you can't, I'll be monitoring the chat. Um, and hopefully you can see my screen as well. Um, so without further ado, I will get started. Um, and if you have any questions throughout, I'll be keeping an eye on the chat as best I can, um, which actually may not be wonderful. I don't have two screens the way I normally do at work, but I, I will do my best to keep an eye on the chat. And uh, yes, so I will just get started. Um, so today, we are going to be talking about escaping the jaws of predatory publishers, which probably sounds more dramatic than it actually is. Um, and so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to provide a brief introduction to the WRHA virtual library in case you aren't already familiar with our services and to also highlight what we're still doing while we're working from home and what we're not. Um, I'm also going to describe the history and the nature of predatory journals. And it turns out, by the way, that I can see the chat just fine. So feel free to ask questions in the chat if you want to. Um, and uh, I'll be demonstrating the problems that arise from the use, of, the use and the existence of predatory journals. And I will establish how to identify and how to avoid these journals, both as venues for publication and as uh, resources for your use in your own research. So the WRHA Virtual Library, we provide service to the people who work at the WRHA, um, including eligible community health agencies and eligible personal care homes. Um, we provide access to an array of online electronic resources uh, like Medline, like CINAHL, that sort of thing. We also do literature searching, document delivery, and education and training sessions like this one, um, or we will do education and training sessions on demand as well. Um, right now, our document delivery is mostly functioning, uh, but normally we would be willing to provide physical items to you. Uh, likewise, normally we would be willing to do in-person visits to do education sessions. Right now, we will not be delivering any physical items and we will not be doing in-person sessions. We'd have to do sessions like this online. So the big question, what are predatory publishers? Now, maybe you've heard of them, maybe you haven't. Um, there seems to be a, a range of experiences with that. A lot of people have just heard the term but don't really know what it means. And that's not really surprising. For a long time, it was sort of a nebulous term. But um, last year, there was a, a large scale gathering of experts, people who look into predatory journals who are studying it. And this is really a, a relatively new field. So this is most of the experts, if not all of them. Um, and they describe predatory journals and publishers as entities that prioritize, uh, and I've just got the, well, I've just got the thing over top of it, so I can't quite read it off for you. <laughs> but they prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship and are characterized by false or misleading information uh, deviation from best editorial and publication practices, a lack of transparency, and or the use of aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation processes. Now, the big part of that that matters the most, as far as I'm concerned, is the uh, prioritizing self-interest, that is prioritizing profit, and that maximization of profit at the expense of scholarship. Um, now, you may be surprised not to see anything about peer review in there. Uh, that's not included in the definition, not, not because it's not an element or a potential element of predatory journals, but because it's something that's very hard to verify. Um, so that's why that wasn't included in the definition. But in the larger paper, there's a note that a lack of peer review is a red flag. It's just not something that it that is easy to tell from the outside whether or not there's peer review and or whether or not the peer review is adequate. We'll talk a little bit more about peer review um, later on in this lecture. So keep your eye out for that. Um, so in terms of predatory publishing, like where did it come from? How did it begin? So the traditional 
academic publishing model is based on subscription fees. Basically, you submit to a journal, the journal publishes it, uh, that's at no cost to you or your institution, um, and then a library or an individual will purchase a subscription or purchase the individual journal or article, and so that's where they get their money, largely from the subscription fees that universities pay, and those can cost quite a bit. So there's been a move in recent years towards open access. That means that the material is no longer behind a paywall, um, and because it's not behind a paywall, then libraries don't have to pay the subscription fees, right? So then where does the money come from? And the money comes from largely the authors. It's something called an author processing charge. Um, and the author processing charge is how they make up the cost that's lost uh, when libraries don't have to subscribe to it because it's available to everyone for free. Um, and so, of course, there are a number of really excellent open access journals. I would say that the future is open access. However, the current structure of this has created a space that can be taken advantage of really easily. It's, it's very easy to set up an exclusively online journal front and make it look like an academic journal and charge people to publish in it and just publish whatever you want. So the term predatory publishing itself was coined in 2010 by Jeffrey Beal, uh, who's an academic librarian in the United States. Um, the term itself has faced some criticism, uh, both because it, it might not be an accurate depiction of what's actually occurring. Are these journals actually preying on people or are they working with them or is it too divisive? Um, but in the consensus statement, they discussed whether or not the term should be replaced with something else, and ultimately they decided this was the term everybody knows. Um, it would be way too much work to try and convince people to use a different term when really what needs to happen is that these journals actually need to start being studied and start being held accountable uh, for what's going on. So that's the history of predatory publishing, where it came from. Um, and so I said we'd come back to peer review. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, peer review is a process in which you send the manuscript that's submitted out to various experts and they comment and they provide feedback, uh, you know, and the feedback might be like, never publish this paper, but more often it's, you know, like here are some things that would strengthen it or this part's not so good or that part's not so good. Um, and then uh, you improve your paper and you make sure that it's uh, sound by academic standards, and then it can be published. Um, and that's pretty much what any quality academic journal will be doing right now, is, is peer review. Um, many predatory journals claim to undertake peer review, though they'll often claim that it's a rapid process, um, and sometimes acceptance can be as fast as within a week or within a couple of days or even a couple of hours, which does not, you know, actually imply peer review. Um, there's also been evidence that peer review that comes out of predatory journals might just be, you know, editorial changes um, like spelling and grammar and that sort of thing, as opposed to genuine examination of the research findings. Um, but there are, there is some evidence that some predatory journals do do peer review, which I would say is not a huge surprise, considering that the journals themselves don't actually have to pay for peer review, I would say that the real test of whether or not uh, the peer review is valid is whether the journal chooses to accept it, even if the author responds with, no, I'm not making any of those changes, just put it up as is, and the journal does. Um, but again, that's something that's very hard to get at unless you're actually seeing that process. Uh, so be cognizant of that. Um, now, in terms of the quality of articles in peer-reviewed journals, um, there's been, I should maybe preface this entire webinar by saying that there hasn't been a great deal of genuine research on predatory journals, despite the fact that it's been a great big talking point in academia and especially in librarianship for over a decade. Most of the stuff written about it has been editorials by people with really strong opinions, um, but there's not a whole heck of a lot of actual genuine research studies done. There's something like 40 of them, and I've read them all. <laughs> uh, So we can only get the vaguest sense 
of what the quality of articles is like in these journals. Um, so there was something in 2013 called the Bohannon Sting, where John Bohannon submitted 304 poor quality articles. Like they were, you know, they looked like standard scientific papers, but if if anybody who was versed in the field looked at them, there were immediate and glaring flaws. And so he submitted them to uh, open at various open access journals, and over half of those journals accepted them. Um, this sting operation led to meaningful change in the Directory of Open Access Journals, the DOAJ. Um, and so, you know, there's a sense that they'll accept really bad articles. Now, there have been other sting operations that I haven't talked about. There have been ones where uh, somebody just, you know, they took their cell phone and they did the uh, the auto fill text and wrote an entire that way about nuclear physics. Um, and that paper was accepted. There was another one where somebody got sick of the, the soliciting emails and just made a paper consisting of nothing but the words, get me off your fucking mailing list in you know, in the text and in these diagrams and this sort of thing. And then the journal responded back to him like, congratulations, it's been accepted. And he's like, I almost fell out of my chair <laughs> because it obviously wasn't meant to be accepted. And they're like, for all, you know, the low, low price of a thousand dollars, we'll publish it for you. Um, and so these, these sting operations suggest that there's, you know, there's a genuine lack of quality. That said, there's been some criticism of sting operations because probably most articles that are submitted to predatory journals aren't deliberately bad, uh, like the ones in the sting operations are. Um, and so that said, there have been some studies done on the like actual studies, not just sting operations, um, that suggest the articles are poor quality. Um, so a recent assessment, and by recent I mean 2017, uh, looked at the quality of predatory or the quality of the content of articles in predatory nursing journals, um, and they looked like genuine articles. But the research found that a lot of them had flawed research design. They were of poor average quality, and that plagiarized content was common. Now, one thing that is should be noted about this particular study: first of all, it's one study, and second of all, they didn't have a control group. Um, so they didn't look at non-predatory journals. So it's unclear if this is, I mean, hopefully it's not representative of, of nursing journals in general, but we don't know, right? Um, and so then there was another study uh, in 2017, this one in Nature, and suggested that they typically display bad reporting or bad methods or both. Um, but it should be noted that there absolutely can be quality content in these journals because, as I say, most people aren't submitting deliberately bad articles, and many of them might not know that they're submitting to predatory journals. Uh, they might have been tricked. We'll talk a little bit more about who publishes in predatory journals uh, in a little bit. I am also going to take a brief second to talk about a subspecies of predatory journals, and these are hijacked journals. Now, hijacked journals, they're even worse, maybe, than your standard predatory journals because they're not, they're deliberately trying to look like another journal. So you, you maybe have a major journal in your field. One in my field is the Journal of Academic Librarianship, and so you might have one that's the Journal of Academic Librarianship Studies. And so you go there and you go to submit and you think it's a Journal of Academic Librarianship because they've made the website look like that and maybe they've put studies in tiny font. Um, and so you think you've been accepted to this really prestigious journal when in fact you've just submitted to, you know, a, a dog in a pair of glasses pretending to be a human, right? Um, and so that's that's something to watch out for. This is especially concerning because there are a few journals, not very many anymore, but there are a few journals that don't actually have websites that still take in mail and submissions only. Um, and these journals, uh, many of them, a website has been set up, but it's not the website of the actual journal. Um, so that's something to watch out for as well. And sometimes they don't even, you know, they just take the exact same name of the real journal and and don't even bother to add like studies to the end of it to make it slightly different. 
Um, and, and, you know, you'll see, you know, instead of the Elsevier logo, they'll have like Elsevier with two E's or something and a slightly different drawing just to try and fool you into thinking that this is the actual uh, journal that you're wanting to submit to. Um, there's also increasingly an issue of predatory conferences um, where, you know, they claim there are these big events. Normally they're in, you know, fancy vacation destinations that you really want to travel to and this sort of thing. And they cost quite a bit of money, but, you know, they're in Hawaii and you take a look at the list of keynote speakers and it's all these incredible people in your field. And you're like, well, I've never heard of this conference before, but I think I'm going to go anyways. And then you find out that in fact, none of those keynotes are actually planning to be there. They've never heard of the presentation. You show up and there's like three different conferences crammed into one room and it's like four people and they're all speaking about different topics. And uh, so anyways, that's, that's an increasing problem. Um, it's just sort of started to come out of the woodwork within the last couple of years. Uh, but it is one of those things where you do want to, if, you know, if, if there's some big hotshot presenting at this conference you've never heard of, you might want to message the hotshot and be like, hey, are you actually presenting there? And if they say, no, I've never heard of that, then, then be aware. Another defining feature of predatory journals is how they contact you. And this is done through spam. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I get a lot of these messages um, almost every day. And you know, they all sound sort of similar. Dear M. Maureen, not sure what that means. Um, you know, greetings, Journal of Nur Nursing Studies is inviting editorial board members. We're aware of your reputation. Now, I have published in nursing journals before, but I am not a nurse. And I do not have a reputation in the nursing field. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you get these messages and you get just hundreds of them. Honorable Dr. Maureen Babb, I am not a doctor. And I'm sure there are many people who would say I'm not honorable either. Uh, dear Dr. Maureen Babb, greetings of the day. Dr. Dr. M. Maureen Babb. And it just goes on and on and on. And then you'll see in this last one, here's one where they're trying to get you to join and they, they look at look at all these great impact factors. Look at how real they are. Now, if you don't know what an impact factor is, an impact factor is a way of assessing the the impact of a journal, like how far it reaches out into the field. It's often misused by people looking to, to publish in a prestigious journal. It's actually a tool that's supposed to be used for librarians to determine whether or not they should subscribe to a set of journals. Um, but regardless, there's only one real impact factor and that comes through journal citation reports. These these scientific journal impact factors, indicates, index Copernicus value, um, all these, these are made up. Um, and they're, they're made up in sort of a weird way where there's like a little cottage industry of these other impact factors where I think you just pay money and say, you know, I want my, my journal to have this really good impact factor and then they pop it on there. Um, so it's like a, a predatory, a predatory industry within a predatory industry. It's kind of bizarre. Um, anyway, so the question, who publishes in these journals, right? Like these things that I'm showing you, these things that I'm telling you paint this, this terrible picture of like, these journals are just made of garbage and how could anybody believe in them? But the fact is that probably most people who are publishing in them have been tricked. They don't realize that these are predatory journals. They've received an email saying like, hey, we saw that you presented at this conference. That seems like a good match for a journal. How about you submit a paper? Um, and especially for young researchers who maybe that's the first time they've ever been contacted, they might not know, right? They might not know that that's not typically how you get journal articles published. And I mean, every now and then you are solicited. You are solicited very, legitimately by an actual publication that is interested in your work. It's not common, but it does happen. Um, and so I would say that that probably makes up the bulk of this. Again, this hasn't been studied overly much, um, but there's, there's certainly indications that most people publishing in these journals don't know that they're publishing in predatory journals. But there are some people who publish knowingly, 
And so it might be for speed because they need to have a publication in before, say, their promotion deadline or their uh, or their uh, tenure application or whatever. Uh, there might be people who want to game the system who are able to just like pop out 15 publications a year. And, uh, you know, if, if nobody's actually assessing the quality of your publications, well, I'm sure it would be very easy to pop out 15 publications a year. Um, maybe there are people who think who know that there won't be accepted, their work won't be accepted as is by an authentic journal and they just want it published, so they send it off. Um, there's been some evidence that there are people with political or financial motivations. There's been some evidence, for example, of uh, certain pharmaceutical com companies uh, publishing in predatory journals in order to get their stuff out faster so that the drug can get on the market faster and they can start making money from it. Now, when they've assessed the articles that they know that do that, those are ones that probably would have passed peer review, but because it's faster to publish it in these garbage journals, that's where they publish it. Um, and then there are a number of people who don't see the problem, who, who just think, well, this is just as good as any other journal. Um, that's fine. I don't care. I'm going to submit it wherever I want. Um, and again, until this is studied more, we don't know what the breakdown of, of that sort of percentage is. There have definitely been studies of this, uh, not very many, I think there have only been three uh, that looked at motives for, for publishing in predatory journals. Um, most, as I say, are people who didn't know that they were predatory journals. And then next to that, the, the highest ranking is someone who do it because of uh, the publish or perish pressure. Um, so, but why are predatory journals a problem? That, that last one on the list, the people who don't see it as a problem, well, what is the problem? So the main problem or the main problems are uh, the polluting of the literature. If you've got subpar quality articles coming in, uh, then first of all, you have to weed through all of that information. And second of all, like maybe you, an expert in your field, are able to weed through it and be like, well, that's garbage, that's garbage, that's garbage. But if it's somebody who's not an expert in the field, they might not be able to do that. Um, and so how can they tell the difference between a paper that's saying, you know, here's here's a rigorous study that looks at uh, different cures for or different possible cures for COVID-19. And here's one that suggests that drinking bleach is a great idea. Like, you know, you know, um, there's also the potential for scholars to scholars or other professionals to present themselves as being more um credential than they actually are to have more experience to have more background and to therefore be placed in positions that they shouldn't necessarily have uh based on their their publication history um there's also damage to the reputation of people and uh institutions that publish in these journals especially this is especially true for people who are are younger um, or, or people who, who were just tricked in general, right? Like you find out that you've published in this journal and it's like, oh no, and there's the potential that this could cause problems for you in your career going forward. Um, and then uh, there's also the lack of permanence. I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but as I mentioned, there are certainly good articles that probably have been submitted to these journals. Um, but these journals don't adhere to the uh the what was the the editorial standards right and so one of those editorial standards is that sort of continuity the ability that these articles will be findable that they'll be maintained that it's not just a website in somebody's basement that's going to be gone in a year and with it your research um, and then the question is, where is the problem? Uh, for a long time, the stereotype, and again, I want to stress that for a long time, there was no real research done on this at all, and it was just people's opinions. The stereotype was that it was pretty much exclusively younger people and people in developing nations that were publishing in these journals, which is frankly an incredibly racist <laughs> assessment. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, but recent studies have shown that no in fact this is a worldwide problem and it's not just you know it's not just developing nations it's all the nations in the world in fact india was shown to have the highest level of publication in these journals followed by the united states 
Um, and then, uh, you know, you've, you've got, it's, it's not just young researchers and it's not just research at sort of like bottom tier colleges or, or universities. You know, there have been people from Harvard publishing in these universities or in these, uh, in these publications as well. So, you know, it is a global problem and it is a problem that is growing. Um, and it's, I'm not sure if you mapped it out, if it would actually be exponentially, but like colloquially it's growing exponentially. Um, so as I say, uh, the damage done, uh, detrimental to the reputation of researchers or institutions, let's say you submit and you decide, oh no, you realize, oh no, that's a predatory publication. I don't want it. The journal, I don't want it up there anymore and I want to submit it to somewhere good. The journal will often say, oh no, we'll only remove it if you pay us a thousand dollars or something like that. And as long as it's up at a predatory journal, as long as it's published elsewhere, you usually can't publish it in a, another journal. Um, there are a few uh, journals out there that are aware of the problem of predatory journals and have made the decision to allow people to publish their work even if it was previously published in a predatory journal but that's not common um yeah and so there's there's difficulty removing the items from journals even if you pay those fees um even if you actually never agreed to submit and you stop halfway through the submission process sometimes they'll put them up anyways uh there's a lack of dois so the lack of findability the lack of permanent storage um you may find it hard or impossible to discover work in an area that's been submitted that was good quality work and then it's just gone. Um, and I think one of the biggest ones is that it undermines the credibility of scholarship um, because there's maybe good quality articles next to these really terrible quality articles that people have just paid to publish. Um, and there's potential for misuse by people with uh, political or financial motivations and there's also, you know, when, when academics talk about this, they tend, we tend to talk about it in the, you know, the academic frame, right? But the truth is that this information, despite me talking about it not being findable, it is open access. It is available to anybody who wants to read it if they can find it. And if they can find it, then they can, find the information in and then say, this is great. And so the general public who may or may not have the assessment skills necessary to determine what's a valid article and what's not, uh, won't necessarily know how to do that. One of the uh, major authors in the field of studying predatory journals talks about how he had a family member who had cancer who got really hopeful about some treatment, but it was just something that somebody had made up in a and put in a predatory journal in order to sell basically snake oil um so that's a real concern um and unfortunately an area that hasn't been studied very much but the number of publications in this area are ramping up so that's good to know i'm just taking a look at my time oh dear i'm running uh so i don't know if you can stick around for longer i've clearly gone over half an hour here there's still a fair bit more um Feel free to leave at any point. I am going to continue talking because there is so much. I'm sorry, this was initially a one hour presentation and I thought I'd cut it down to half an hour, but obviously I was mistaken. So what's the reach of predatory journals? Um, the reach can be quite far. This article that's linked here about chocolate accelerating weight loss, this was another sting operation by John Bohannon in 2015, where they wrote a fake article again, and it was one that you know, was not good quality. And basically the finding was that chocolate helps weight loss. And, and then they set up a press release for it and it got taken up by media all over the world. Um, and it, it reached quite far. Um, you can read about it. Uh, I think it's a, a Boing Boing article there that I fooled millions into thinking chocolate helps weight loss. Here's how. Um, so that's, that's very, uh, readable um, article, journal, blog post sort of thing. Um, it can also cause problems within disciplines, even with experts. Uh, one area that's talked about there being problems is uh, taxonomy of uh, like ichthyological taxonomy, so fish. Um, and that's one of those disciplines where when you discover a fish and you, you give it a name or something, who, 
whichever name comes first has priority. And so it's very important that those sorts of naming conventions are permanent and that they've been uh, accurately studied to make sure that you're not just giving a, a different name to a fish that already has a name or anything like that, right? So that's that's been a problem. Um, and presumably it's a problem in other fields as well. It's just the ichthyologists have written about it and other disciplines haven't yet. Um, and then what I was talking about within the public eye, these studies look authentic. If you find them on Google Scholar and they will show up on Google Scholar because that's just a web crawler, it pulls from anything that looks academic. Um, and so they look authentic to, especially to the untrained eye, but also to people who are just skimming and looking at abstracts and not reading the whole work. So how common are predatory insurance? Now this is something that you can't really know because we don't know how many predatory journals there are in total or how many journals there are in total. Um, this graph shows the percentage of, uh, you know, based on the predatory journals that we know of what disciplines they're in. This isn't an indication that 30% of all science journals are predatory, we don't know that. Um, but so you can see that science and medicine and health are sort of the two top, um, the two top areas where predatory journals exist. Um, and then uh, there have been certain studies that have looked at the number of predatory journals within a certain field. Uh, it's been suggested that there are quite a few predatory journals in neurology, for example, and in uh, case studies, like journals, it's been suggested that as many as half of new case studies journals uh, might be predatory. Um, and until more work is done, we won't know the extent of this. As I say, um, the number of predatory journals also isn't static. They're increasing year by year because, hey, it's a, an easy and fast way to make money. Um, so how do you avoid them? Okay, well, there are a couple of different standard tools. There are lists of predatory journals and lists of approved journals. There are checklists of things that are going on. The best way I would say is critical assessment of information. And like, you know, take a look at the journal page. And if you're just looking for resources, take a look at the article and read the whole article. Don't just read the abstract, you know, read it critically as you would any article. Um, and then trust your spidey sense, but be careful to avoid bias. Um, there's been some suggestion that this is a, a bad way to talk about it because, you know, people might say, oh, well, you know, this, this journal seems sketchy, but the only reason they think it's sketchy is because it's being published in India, which is, not a reason to consider a journal sketchy, right? So, you know, do these things. So here are some lists. Um, the big one for years and years was Beale's list. Um, that's no longer maintained. There are mirrored websites that are maintained by somebody, nobody knows who. Um, there's Cabell's, they've got a white list and a black list. Um, and uh, then they've got uh, lists of approved journals or lists of approved journals. So there's the Directory of Open Access Journals, which, as I mentioned, made those major changes after the Bohannon sting. There's Cabell's whitelist. Um, and then there's uh, curated databases like Medline, where there's been some thought put into what's included in them. Um, and as I mentioned, Google Scholar is not one of these. It's just a web crawler. It pulls from wherever. Um, but there's a major problem with lists. First of all, uh, most of the, like Beale's list had a, a tremendous issue with the lack of transparency. There's no real sense of what criteria he was using to determine whether or not something was a predatory journal. Um, and and the, the, you know, there's changing situations of publishers. There were a couple that seemed predatory at first, but turned their act, or act around. And now they're very good, reputable journals and, and publishers. Um, for the ones like Cabell's, there's a real cost of maintenance uh, in terms of, so they're making an effort to be really transparent about their processes, but you also have to pay to see the lists. So for instance, I don't have access to those lists um, because our library doesn't subscribe to them. Um, there's also the potential for misclassification. Uh, what happens if a journal gets misclassified by accident and it ruins the reputation or, or if something gets, you know, okayed when actually it's it's not okay, and you know 
The, trouble, the main trouble with lists is that they are an attempt at a simple answer for a really complicated problem. Um, so, you know, look at lists if you want, but don't consider them to be a be-all and end-all. Um, and what about these curated databases? What about PubMed? What about Medline? What about other databases? So PubMed uh, has been shown to have some problems with uh, predatory journals sneaking in, especially through PubMed Central. Um, so there definitely are predatory journals within PubMed. They try and clear them out, but how successful that is, who knows? And other databases, most other databases have been shown to have predatory journals in them as well, small numbers of them, but predatory journals nonetheless. And I should note that these predatory journals have been identified using Beale's list, which again, we're not sure about the transparency of, so maybe there aren't predatory journals in there, as I say. It's complicated. So what do you do with all this complicated information? Well, you want to do things on a case-by-case -case basis, really. And, and the strongest thing you can do is you can assess what you're looking at. You can assess both the journal and the content of your article, right? Um, so there are tools out there. There's Think, Check, Submit. Uh, there are these checklists, one from the University of Saskatchewan, uh, one from uh, uh, Reels, Kennedy, and Blas, and, and you can take a look at the techniques they have. The one from the University of Saskatchewan is very good in terms of assessment, but there's also a heck of a lot to it. And realistically, you're not going to, as you're going through the studies, uh, you're not going to be looking up for every single journal that you're reading a paper on all these, all these resources or all these uh, things to check out, like, you know, about the editorial board or about the place of publication or about how many back issues they have or about their submission policies or anything like that. Um, and so then, uh, you know, maybe you'll want to do that if you're thinking of submitting to a journal, but realistically, nobody's going to do it when they're thinking of using a resource from a journal. So. Take a look at the content of the article itself. And then there are a couple of sort of key red flags. One of them is low author processing charges, um, say less than 150 United States dollars. Uh, but there's, I've, I've seen articles that have suggested that the opposite is true as well. Really exorbitant uh, author processing charges might also be an issue. Um, if there's spelling or grammar or distorted images on the journal site, uh, that's a common one. It's becoming less common, I would say. The, a lot of the predatory journal pages look quite quality now. Um, if there's an overly broad journal scope, now this is a fairly good one. Like if you have a journal that supposedly covers all of science or, or you know, if it's got really weird combinations of things, Arctic science and the study of amphibians or something like that. Like, you know, that's that's a red flag. Um, uh, but the biggest one, in my opinion, is if you go to the journal page, does the language target the authors or the readers? And if it's targeting the authors, it's probably a predatory journal. Um, the promises of rapid publication again, and uh, the lack of information on retracted, retraction policies, manuscript handling, and data preservation. Uh, those are some key red flags. Uh, you can read more about this in uh, the article that I've linked at the bottom there in Nature, uh, Stop This Waste of People, Animals, and Money. Um, great place to start. So the key takeaways from this should be that predatory journals are a problem and they're a growing problem, but there are no simple answers for dealing with them. Assessment uh, is your best precaution against both publishing in them and against using them in your own research. Um, do make sure that you read the whole article, not just not just the abstract. Um, and the red flags are just that they're flags. None of them is a stop for sure. This is absolutely a predatory journal. Um, you do have to use your judgment. Um, and no single flag absolutely indicates a predatory journal. So it's complicated, basically. Uh, so, sorry for going over time. Uh, does anybody have any questions? And I'll just stay on the line and mute myself. I'll give you a little bit, and uh, if not, feel free to log off.
and the recording will be up probably tomorrow, uh, but maybe not until Friday. Um, so, and I will send the slides to people who registered both for this session and for the earlier session that had to be rescheduled for something outside my control. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, and oh, there's one. Uh, oh, it's just a thank you. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for coming to this one, <laughs> even though the the earlier one didn't end up working out. So, um, but if there are no further questions, then I will log off, and I hope you all have a great day. Bye.